Okay. So, thank you very much for still being here at the end of a long day. It's been fantastic, hasn't it? Uh, but I understand you're quite tired. So, I've gone for kind of cartoons and quizzes for this afternoon's final keynote. Uh, so, could you have a dig in your packs for me and see if you could find the quiz? I'm probably gone low tech. It's called What Kind of Digital Leader Are You? You'll need an old-fashioned pen, or if you haven't got one, ask your neighbour. <laughs> Have you found it? What kind of digital leader are you? So we're going to have a few breaks in the presentation to talk about your results on some of this. So you can be filling it in as I talk, or you can wait until the breaks to fill it in, depending on how interested you are in what I'm saying during the talk. Um, and my talk's going to be a little bit different than Audrey's, although it's, it's covering a similar kind of area, but I guess a different style of talk. And like Audrey, I was really intrigued by the conference theme, rising to the challenge, and, and that's the bit that I've picked up on. And also you will have noticed that Audrey asked quite a similar question about who determines how we reconstitute technology-enhanced learning. And uh, you could be thinking, as I'm introducing myself and introducing the talk, who do you see around this table? Which, which names are you putting to these faces around this recipe for change? Who are the decision makers in your organization? Who are the people who are having these conversations? So I was looking at your conference theme, Rise into the Challenge, and I was reflecting on the 20, thank you very much, at least 20 odd years that I've been working in this area, and what the challenges have been. And of course, the challenges have changed over the years, but there's still challenges for some people out there. So I guess when I was starting out, the challenge was very much access, living in a rural community in Cornwall, waiting for broadband to arrive, actually working at the University of Plymouth where we were, had a luxury of having a TV studio and a satellite uplink and seeing if we could reach some communities in our objective one area by downloading, uh, sending TV programs to them. The challenge of technological determinism that you see and hear all the time, the belief that it is the technology that is the driver of change. And although you can argue that in either direction, what it leads to, I think, is a kind of passivity that, oh, well, the change is coming, the technology is coming, we'll just let it sweep over us and see what's happening. And trying to encourage people to shape their organisational response a little bit more. The challenge of being a lone voice, certainly when I started out, the challenge of being a lone voice and saying, hey, this uh, FTP thing is fantastic, it's brilliant, you can download files from all over the world, come and have a look. And then the challenge of there being so many voices and you don't know who to listen to and there's an overload of information and everyone's scenario planning and trying to predict the future. And uh, as was said in my introduction, the challenge of hearing the learner voice in all of this and finding ways to uncover the learner's experience and use them in our planning, and I'll say a little bit about those. So these are all valid challenges, but the one I've chosen to focus on for the talk this afternoon is the organisational response. So one, I think one of the challenges that's really hit us at the moment, and I've seen it very much, I've been here all day listening to your talks, which have been fantastic, uh, is that we can do innovation can't we? There's loads of examples of innovative practice. And you can do pedagogy. Uh, and I think one of our challenges is taking that innovation, taking our understanding of teaching and learning, we're, we're good at those, and thinking, how do we shift those up to whole organisational responses? So who did you see around your table here? And someone just want to shout out, who did you picture around this table? You, I don't mean names, but kind of roles, maybe? <laughs> Who do you see are the leaders making these, uh, bringing the changes? Teachers. Okay, practitioners, teachers, yeah, the people who are actually doing it on the ground, yeah, that we should be watching and seeing what their ideas are and which of those we're going to pick up on, absolutely. Students. Yeah, yeah, students, some students, talk more about that later, some students, yeah. Okay, anything else? Third wave professional. Yes. Third space Third professional, space. yes, yeah. Celia Whitchurch and things. Yes. Absolutely, going to talk about that as well. Fabulous. Yep. Okay. 
Nobody's saying senior management team. <laughs> Is that deliberate? So this, oh, not that one. I'll go back. So I wanted to show you, if I could, just switch to... All right. So this is actually a recorded webinar, and this is my senior management team um, recording a webinar for us yesterday on higher education, uh, the wider, the future of higher education. And uh, this is great that they've got webinar skills. So they're up there in the corners, my VC and my, my Pro Vice Chancellor, uh, doing their first staff development webinar for us as part of a new programme. And actually the VC is talking about Brexit and talking about the possibility of the UK leaving the, the European Union. And I have to admit, I'm one of those people who's clogging up your passport office at the moment, just kind of cashing in my Irish heritage to get an Irish passport just in case it all goes badly wrong on the 23rd of June. And certainly having some senior staff with digital capabilities is really helpful, but I think we all have responsibility for leadership. And I want to talk about shared leadership, distributed leadership. We all have responsibility for leading our institutional responses in this digital age. The other thing I wanted to pick out of your, your title is challenge, and I think you're right that it's really challenging times, and you, you had a little preview of my challenging times slide here. Images like this do come to mind. So of course Kodak is famous for not responding quickly enough to the advent of digital photography and digital storage, and um, we do wonder whether all HE providers will be able to respond to the challenge of the digital age. So note I say all HE, are we all going to be able to do it? Will all of our organisations be able to move fast enough in response to, for example, we've heard today about the needs of employers, the kinds of things that employers are looking for, uh, students who can, graduates who can use industry standard technologies, who are really adaptable and flexible in their approach to learning new technology. Are we going to be able to move fast enough? Uh, will employers prefer to educate their own? Higher apprenticeships are really big news at the moment in the UK, where employers and universities are co-designing what the curriculum should be and delivering those. I, I worry for some of our courses in things like music technology, cyber security, these kinds of things. Are universities going to be able to keep up with what employers need? Nokia again, a uh, very famous example, completely knocked sideways by the emergence of the iPhone. Nokia built good phones, but no one really had any idea that we were going to move so fast towards touchscreen that the whole idea of what a phone would be would change so convincingly, would overtake all other concepts of what a phone looked like. When the next disruptive technology comes, will we be quick enough to move? Will it be left to the private providers who are entering higher education so fast, more agile, more customer focused? Will it be up to them to really decide how to respond? So I wanted to say something about disruptive technologies. There's been loads of talk about disruptive technologies, and I've seen Gartner's hype cycle two, three times today already, so I'm really glad I didn't choose that one. Um, but this is a similar kind of thing from Clay Christensen uh, in terms of looking at the path of disruptive innovation. So there's been loads of talk over the years, loads and loads about disruptive innovation technology. Um, but I'll just explain this one a little bit, which I think is quite interesting. And it looks at... Uh, how you meet uh, your most demanding customers' needs and your least demanding customers' needs. So you've got your most demanding customers over the top there. And, and Clay Christian says that what most of universities are doing at the moment is standard management practice. They're giving their most demanding customers more of what they say they want. Okay? So our learners say they want ubiquitous Wi-Fi, um, a VLE, online submission of assignments, and we're making all of those things slightly better every year, incremental improvement. Um, but it's hard, and it's hard to distinguish between the different providers, and it's hard to meet um, the student expectations. And student satisfaction surveys kind of encourage this approach. And Christensen's advice is to look down at the bottom here at the least demanding customers, or even our non-customers, 
Uh, who is educating the people who are choosing not to come to university or to college? Um, who is educating the learners who are not logging in to the VLE? What's their experience? What's happening to them? And I wonder if we're so focused on meeting the needs of our most demanding customers that we're not watching what's going on underneath. And that's where the disruption comes from. That's where the innovation, disruptive innovation comes from, that we need to be looking at the people who are saying, well, actually, I don't want a three-year degree. I want a two-year fast track. I want something different. I want to be in work as well. Where are those kind of conversations coming from? Now, if I'm sounding a little bit like education is a product or a service that can be sold, and Audrey warned us against this kind of management speak, didn't she? Um, well, that's because I'm visiting today from the UK. And the UK is definitely creating higher education as a competitive marketplace. The white paper, we had a preview with the green paper in November. The white paper came out last week or the week before. And there is no doubt anymore, if, if there was any remaining doubt, that it is a competitive marketplace. And I've just picked out some of the quotes here. We've had specific measures to lower the barriers to entry for new higher education providers, to make it easier for new providers to get in. We've had the application of the Competitions and Market Authority rules to higher education to make sure that everything we say we're going to deliver to our students, we actually really do have to deliver to them. There's the proposal to create an office for students to make us more customer-driven and more customer-focused. So no doubt at all that we're operating within some kind of competitive market. So... What I'd like you to do is to have a go at that first bit of the um, questionnaire then. We talked about um, knowledge as digital leader. We've talked about some of the key trends. So can you list the key trends in learning technology and explain the impact on your own organization? Can you, like my senior management team, use the same technologies as uh, digitally able students? So just have a go now, just doing this first sheet, knowledge rule. Tick your boxes, add up your score and then we'll see what kind of results you got. If when you've done the first page, knowledgeable page, you put your pens down and look at me, I'll know who's finished. <clears throat> Thank you. <laughs> okay. Another ten seconds. Well, uh, I think you've all been sat down for quite long enough this afternoon, so could everyone stand up for me, please? Stretch your legs. Ooh. <laughs> With sound effects, like it. <laughs> okay, so if your total score was between six or nine, you can sit down again. <clears throat> if your total score was between... 10 and 14, you can sit down again. Yay. <laughs> you are a very knowledgeable lot. So you're very high scoring. So these are all your people who've scored 15 or more on knowledge. So these are your knowledgeable digital leaders that you need to look at who's sitting next to you, and, uh, or standing, I should say. OK, you can sit down. So I just wanted to show you that I'm not the only one to be worried. 
about uh, some of these issues. Uh, this is PA Consulting who do an annual report uh, where they go and uh, give a survey to vice chancellors, UK vice chancellors, and uh, ask them what their, their concerns are. And I'll just see if some of this video can play, just for a couple of minutes. We've just published the seventh of our annual surveys of, of university vice chancellors. Uh, and it's interesting to see how over the seven years we've charted the course of universities moving from essentially agents of government policy on higher education to being organisations that have to find their own way in a global marketplace for students and research. Um, this year's subject was all about innovation. That's right. What we did, we identified about seven broad themes of innovation in higher education provision that we've been observing from institutions across the world, not just in the UK, but internationally. And, and they range from new models of learning and teaching, new modes of following programs, the integration of technology into the delivery, um, closer relationship of study and work and areas like that. And we asked Vice Chancellors, which of these do you see as potentially game changing, if you like, for higher education? And got a very strong message back, all of them, that all seven of these areas they could see as changing the nature of competition between universities, which yes. is now a global game, and, and in some instances actually affecting the, the survival of institutions. But then when we ask them, so where do you see the UK system in this regard and your own university and how you're innovating, we've got a very different picture where they said, in most of these areas, we actually see the best practice and most innovations happening outside the UK and, and the UK system, as it were, falling behind the yes. pack a bit yes. in, in terms of these things. Yes. And within their own institutions, there are, of course, innovations happening within universities all the time. But in the areas we talked about, Vice Chancellor was saying they tend to happen in pockets yes. and in isolated areas. And we're not very good at generalizing from those things into changing our whole offer. I thought it was very interesting. So I'll just stop it there, but just to help you understand the, the place that I'm coming from, where there's talk of pockets of innovation still, but a problem of transferring that, of generalising that across an institution, where even our vice chancellors are saying, actually, we're a little bit worried about how other countries are moving faster than us, and particularly they identified uh, things like learning analytics as something that the, the UK is not keeping up with what's going on. So a lack of confidence, really, about falling behind. Some of the reasons, uh, if you read the full report, um, I don't know how much you recognise these from your own organisations, but these are some of the reasons that the Vice Chancellors gave for why they thought innovation wasn't really being spread very far. I think we're, we're struggling to make the case for change. Uh, I'm interested particularly in this third bullet point here inflexible organisational structures, systems and processes which make it difficult for us to move on beyond the individual innovator. And this is, a, a, we've seen similar reports over the years, so this was Dave White from uh, Oxford University as then was, did a nice little survey of open distance learning, uh, again in the UK, and came to this conclusion that uh, we were okay on pedagogy, that wasn't really the substantive challenge. The substantive challenge was planning the configuration of supporting infrastructure, resource, business models. Those are the things which are stopping us move on any further. So how do we stop ourselves seeing ourselves as the small guy? Um, yes, we're interested in pedagogy. Yes, we're interested in innovation. But how do we move on from that? One of the tools that's used often in marketing, does anyone here teach marketing, background in marketing, uh, is the Ansoft Growth Vector Matrix. This matrix is familiar. Uh, and what you have here is you have down the left-hand side your market. So are you, are you trying to tap into an existing market, the present market, or are you trying to reach new markets? And what about your product, or you can think of education as a service if you prefer, what along the top is there? Have you got the same, your present educational product, or are you offering something new? And we could try and see what goes into some of these little boxes. 
So we've spent a lot of time, I think, in education looking at market penetration. So we've been looking at, well, we, we know what our offer is in education. It's a three-year degree. And uh, we know who our competitors are, and we just try and steal a few students from our competitors. That's the idea, really. We're, um, I wondered if these were the sea monsters, if these were our promises of transformation that we make in order to say to students, no, come to us. We're the one who can really, uh, we're really working with employers. We can really prepare you for employment. Well, this is our, we, we're working alongside high quality researchers. That's what you'll get here. But very small differences really between institutions. Um, over on, on the new product development, we're saying, well, we're still trying to reach the same students, but uh, we, we think we can offer them something new. We can offer them flipped learning, I've heard a lot of today, blended learning. We'll just offer them something a little bit new and see if that will attract them. And I think that's what we're doing mostly. We're doing an awful lot of stuff on that row. The trouble with that is that the market is not growing and everyone is planning for growth. So all the UK universities have plans for growth. You can go through all their strategic plans. They're all planning to grow by 5%. Well, they can't possibly all grow by 5% because this is the demographics. And, uh, and I know you have a similar uh, thing with a, a dropping population, dropping youth population. And it's really quite dramatic in the UK. So that market penetration isn't going to work because there simply aren't enough 18-year-olds around in order for all the universities to grow at the rate that they would like to. So we need to be thinking about doing something completely different. There is a little blip in this in Scotland. I can't remember what it was. It was something to do with the World Cup or something. <laughs> okay. So I think this is the more interesting row to be looking at and to be thinking about uh, in our roles as digital leaders. So this is when we're talking about developing new markets. So you take an existing product and you take it to a new market, new market development here. So what are we thinking about? We're thinking about... Um, Overseas campuses. You take your existing model of education, you try and tap into a new market. Um, a lot of that distance learning, that overseas learning, falls into that. New products for new markets, diversification. I mean, MOOCs is the classic example. I know everyone's fed up of talking about MOOCs, but who was telling me earlier that there were 35 million... Someone was saying there were 35 million learners in MOOCs and it's growing all of the time, yeah? So that's something we still need to be thinking a lot about. If you're interested in MOOCs and the, the narrative around MOOCs, I would really recommend this, this lovely paper by Neil Selwyn, always a, a good writer. And what they did is they did an analysis of how MOOCs were being written about in the press and uh, found that it's really clear that universities are seeing MOOCs as a way of providing additional income. So even though the academic originators of the MOOCs would argue that it's their pedagogy of openness that's important, you know, the kind of Stephen Downs, Knox, those kind of people, it's, it's the pedagogy of openness that's important. That's not the way they've been grasped. So it's a growing area for us with openness. And they have been portrayed, certainly, as a, a route to monetization. So have a go at the next little bit of the quiz. Have a go. Miss Networked, because you're all here. You're all networking. You've all been chatting to each other all day. I know you can do that. Go, move over to enterprising and some of the ideas that I've talked about there and see if you can give yourself a score for enterprising.
Everyone done? Yes? Let's have a quick look then at who our most enterprising leaders are. Everyone up? <laughs> so quietly and unobtrusively sit down if you were in the kind of six to nine bracket. <laughs> 10 to 14, yeah, about, okay, about half, about half. So 15 plus remaining standing, yes? Excellent, excellent, you can sit down. So we're a knowledgeable, enterprising bunch, fantastic. Okay, so this is the crux of my argument, really. In the olden days, when I used to say to my students, this is the bit to take down, and this is the bit I say, this is the slide to photograph, you know, this is the slide to tweet. This is the crux of my argument. Uh, I think that we have pockets of innovation, and we have a very good understanding of pedagogy now, which is fantastic, but it's not sufficient to take education to the place where it needs to be. We really need to be thinking about whole organisation-wide responses to the challenges of the digital age. And you've just proved by doing my quiz that you are ready to be the digital leaders who can take this forward. And we all have a responsibility for doing this. Now, obviously, what we will do... And someone asked Audrey, so what do we do? about it, yeah, when the questions at the end. What we do will depend on your institutional context. It will depend on your history, your culture, how much money you've got in the bank, your senior manager's appetite for risk. All those things are going to change. So I can't give you the answers, but I can tell you a little bit about what we've been trying to do about it at Oxford Brooks and what I've been thinking, and uh, with varying success and some other examples as well. So I want to give you three examples in this talk. I want to talk about the market penetration idea specifically and what we can do to prepare learners to contribute to a global network society and talk a bit about the learners that we've got coming in. And I want to say something about uh, when we're developing new business models like MOOCs, can we please do that with a really good understanding of the needs and expectations of the learners that we're dealing with? And that actually means going out and talking to some learners. And then someone already said, third space professionals, making it easier to disrupt institutional practices so that we can diversify our offer. And I think our third space professionals are people who work in the, the kind of fluid space between being a traditional academic or a traditional professional services staff, these kind of new roles that are emerging have a lot of flexibility to play a part there. So I'll go through those uh, three ideas one by one. So I start with um, what we're preparing graduates for. So I think one of the ways that an institution can distinguish itself in what is actually quite a difficult market to be competitive in, because we're all offering broadly the same thing, is by uh, explaining to learners and developing our courses so that we're really preparing them for a digital age. So cartoons and quizzes. So we know now that learners are not as digitally skilled as we thought they were a few years back. And they still come to us with these common kinds of problems. Uh, and all the, the digital native stuff, and I don't mean that I'm referring to any particular person's work, but you know, all of this, uh, we've learned a lot about it. We have learned that despite being immersed in technology, young people are not prepared to learn effectively in technology-rich age. In the formal education settings, learners do not transfer well their practices from home into formal education settings. So I agree with Brian uh, that it's the YouTube generation. Yes, and I've got teenage sons of the YouTube generation, absolutely. But they don't necessarily transfer that practices to school, college, and university work. And I was talking, uh, listening to Eleanor McDonald also, Ursia, uh, in business school, saying, well, you know, the, the students are not necessarily tech savvy when they come in. They struggle with technology. They need induction. Okay? So we know a lot more about this now than we used to. We also know we're not that different. So this whole thing about youth and generation isn't really <laughs> as big a deal as we thought it was. So this is a lovely book by Larry Rosen, uh, Eye Disorder. And there's lots and lots of interesting stuff in the book, but the bit I've picked out is how often do you check your text? 
So I've been talking for almost 30 minutes, which means most people, 60% um, of people, 40% of people have already checked their text twice since I've been talking, maybe more. <laughs> okay, so depending on the year you were born, how often do you check your text? And even, or even more interesting, how anxious are you going to feel if you're not checking your text over there? So although, yes, there's some age difference, it's not as big as we expect. And look, we're all as bad as each other. 40% of us are still checking our texts every 10 or 15 minutes and feeling anxious if we don't, OK? Um, uh, someone also asked earlier about um, lonely young people on Facebook, I think, in response to a question uh, after Audrey. And, and this book is great. It talks a lot about uh, some of the um, uh, difficulties that people can have uh, by assuming that life online is actually people's lives and the way that they're presenting themselves on Facebook and social media as happy and everything's all right can be quite damaging if you're a little bit unhappy anyway. So it deals with some of those issues that were raised earlier. So we know there are problems, we know there are skills problems. We can deal with that. We're educators. We can, we can help students develop the skills that they need to. But I, I really uh, have a lot... Um, of, of interest in the kinds of things that Martha Lane Fox is saying. So if you don't know Martha Lane Fox, she's Chancellor of the Open University. She's the CEO of um, Dot Everyone, which is worth looking at the Dot Everyone website. Uh, she's the government's digital champion, okay? And she talks about, well, actually, what we should be doing is not just preparing learners with the skills they need in order to access technology, use technology, even learn with technology, which I've talked a lot about, but actually, they should be preparing them with the skills they need to contribute to society in this global networked age in which we live. So there's a real role for higher education. There's something we could really be doing and saying, well, actually, we are preparing learners to be able to go out and make a contribution to society. Now, there's all sorts of stuff in the UK which is making this more difficult, our shift towards more exams at GCSEs and A-levels, so rather than less coursework, school, you know, the whole function of school just to make sure that kids can get through exams. Those things are making it, it more difficult. But I think we have to keep in mind some of these reasons why we're doing what we're doing why we're enthusiastic about technology because we're preparing students for these worlds that they're going to go and live in. So we've got a definition of digital literacy at our institution. I'm sure many of you have as well. We have five graduate attributes. This is one of our graduate attributes. And it's very much about life. It's about using uh, technologies in a way that's going to support you, not just while you're at university, but actually so you can be a confident, agile adopter in your personal life as well as your academic life and for your professional use. Now, this fits very well. I talked about fitting with institutional history and context. Our founder, John Henry Brooks, the strap line, the quote from him that we use all the time at Oxford Brooks is, living lives of consequence. We want our, our graduates to go out and live lives of confidence. So this kind of thing works works really well. We have two funded projects um, at Oxford Brooks at the moment looking at learning gain, which is the buzzword of the moment. They're a bit early for me to be telling you uh, about them, but maybe I'll come back next year and tell you about them. The learning gain projects we're looking at, well, as well as looking at students' improvement in marks, their development of cognitive skills, can we develop measures? Are there ways that we can say students have developed these kinds of attributes while they've been with us at university? Uh, you know, the work placements we've organised for them, the mentoring we've arranged for them, the co-curricular interdisciplinary hackathons, whatever it is we're doing around the edges, uh, have those helped students to develop these kinds of attributes that we want them to? So I think that's the kind of thing that we should be doing. So talked about... Um, access skills, uh, there's some references there, and uh, we know what we're doing with these, but I think always with this triangle, the thing that I've had most uh, uncertainty about is what goes on at the top of it. So what kind of attributes particularly that we think are going to help learners to contribute to this global network society are going to help them learn. So one of the things that I did last year was a, a meta-analysis, qualitative meta-analysis of a lot of the learner experience research that has been around. One of the things I've been doing over the last 10 years or so is uh, encouraging learner experience research and looking at methods, research methods for uncovering and analysing learners' experience. And I went back to some of my own work and other people's previous work and did this meta-analysis. And, uh, and it's in the references at the back. 
And you'll see these are the kinds of attributes which come out as being important. Now, some of these you can say are to do with technology. Some of them uh, we would expect from all learners, I think, probably engaged and self-aware. Well, there's no big changes there from before we had technology-rich courses. But being more adaptable, being more intentional about your use of technology, obviously being connected, these are the things which we need to be starting to think about. How do we develop these in our learners? And that's quite a different model of education. If these are your outcomes, these are your learning outcomes, it's really quite a different model of teaching in order to get students to the point where they can say that they are confident, engaged, self-aware, those kinds of things. The way that we've been doing it is largely through the uh, curriculum initially and then just starting to use it uh, beyond the curriculum. Uh, students learn best in the disciplinary context. Uh, they trust their lecturers, so we asked all of our lecturers to go away and think about what digital literacy meant within the context of their subject. They, uh, you can't read these, but they're up on our website if you want to go and have a look. So these are examples from all the different courses of how they define digital and information literacy within their, their programme. We did it at the programme level. We did this a few years ago. We spent a lot of time talking about contextualising digital information literacy within the discipline. And then... Uh, Amanard about showing you this slide. This is one always Amanard, not terribly good results for Brooks. And then a couple of years later, we tried to measure it. So in our student engagement survey, we asked students about the opportunities that they've had to develop digital and information literacy. These results are actually from 2014. We've just repeated the survey, literally just closed last Friday, so I haven't got the results yet, but I will have soon. Hope there's going to be an improvement <laughs> from those. So you can see from our learners here, well, 56% of the respondents to the student engagement survey said yes, they had had opportunities to critically evaluate digital sources of information, but only 27% said that while they'd been at Oxford Brooks, they'd used technology to reflect on and record their learning. Now, when these results came out in 2014, in a way it was great because then our Pro Vice Chancellor set up a tail steering group and you know, started really looking at some of these things. So I do hope we've got some improvement in those. So that, that's my first kind of suggestion for an organisational response, is thinking about what you're preparing your graduates for, thinking about attributes as well as knowledge and, and access and skills, thinking about how you contextualise that within the discipline, and how you monitor it, so how you can show that the work that you're doing is having some good effect. My second suggestion then is about uh, learners' experiences and expectations. I think we need to be much more connected with what our learners are actually doing. So uh, I'm sure you've all seen enough photos of people's dinners on Facebook to know how people are actually using social media. We need to be a lot more connected with what's actually going on. And we need to make sure that our business models are really based on a thorough understanding of learners' practices, their needs, their expectations. Instead, we have these. We have satisfaction surveys, uh, satisfaction with the VLE, monitoring usage of the VLE, those kinds of things. And I had a look at ours from the Brooks Barometer, our one of our satisfaction, one of our satisfaction surveys from a couple of years ago. And there's no real surprises here anymore, are there? These are things that we already know. So we know what students like about our use of technology. It's about convenience, access, being able to contact people. And we know what they're dissatisfied with. So these aren't really showing us anything. So we need some new ways of thinking about uh, how we can understand the learner experience. And particularly, how we can understand uh, practices, what it is that learners are actually doing with technology. So you may have seen some of these examples before. They've been quite widely disseminated. But um, does anybody know what happens um, to a book if you microwave it? <laughs> so this was um, uh, a study by Martin Oliver and Leslie Gourlay at University College London and they were interview interviewing postgraduate researchers about their digital practices and they came across this fabulous student Yuki and, and uh, put the reference in there and uh, Yuki discovered or I don't know found out that if you microwave a book it destroys the glue of the binding and once the glue of the binding's gone, you've got loose leaf pages, and you can put them through an industrial photocopier and scan all the pages. Yeah. <laughs> and then you can put it on your iPad, 
Yes, so she was buying up second-hand copies of books, microwaving them, putting them through the, uh, <laughs> the photocopier. Now it gets better, all right? Putting them in the iPad, then putting the iPad in a plastic wallet so she could read it in the bath. <laughs> and this is one of the photos that Yuki took uh, when they were asked to take photos of how they use technology. All right. Now, actually, for Yuki, the bath had all sorts of kind of social and cultural significance, and so it was really important. And also, when you got down to why on an iPad, why don't you just take the book into the bath? It was all about her content curation, her annotations and stuff, so she had good reasons for it. So we have some really highly sophisticated use of technology, really personalised for people's context. Some, some of our learners are using technology in really interesting ways. Now, how could we have found that out from a satisfaction survey? We, we wouldn't have known uh, the kind of format that, we, that this student wants things to be delivered in, the kinds of practices that they're evolving for themselves. Uh, Leslie Gawley has also written separately, but for, using data from the same study, uh, about binary divisions between online, distance, face-to-face, -face, mobile, home, work, places of study, and got students to draw maps of where they study and what they're doing in each place, and found that actually these, these binary differences don't exist for learners at all. They have no conception of what an online course is and how it might be different from a face-to-face, -face, which is how we market our courses as online courses. Because every bit of learning uses a significant amount of technology for them. So what does this online thing mean? And there really aren't clear divides, OK? So I think the problem is that we're in danger, and our digital leaders, our leaders, are in danger of making grand-scale policy decisions about technology use without really attending to what learners are actually doing. So there's a, there's a big movement of learner experience research which has really tried to develop different tools to help us access learners' experiences. So things like sending learners out with cameras, saying, take pictures of where you study, come back and talk to me about it. Day experience method, Chris Jones has used. Um, you know, so you text students five times during the day with a quick lot of questions saying, tell me who you're with, where, where you are, um, what are you doing right now, how, are you, how happy are you feeling about it, those kinds of things. So lots of different ways. I did a bit of work um, in further education last year for the GISC and uh, was really, mm, I found this quite a difficult piece of work to do because further education is going through an awful lot of change. Oops, I've just jumped to ahead there. Um, at, at the moment, um, funding changes, government intervention, highly interventionist government, and there are loads of reports from different sector organisations in further education uh, awash with these kind of reports which present learners as confident, positive users of technology, motivated about the technology. They talk about learners as our digital champions, the need for the learners to be partners in deciding how we're going to use technology in the future. All these sector reports say these similar kinds of things, but they are not research-based at all. There's no research cited in any of them. There are just these assumptions about what it is that learners are doing and what it is that learners need. So um, I was very pleased to be funded by the GISC to do a project in further education where we went out and ran focus groups with 200 learners in FE. Uh, we did surveys of IT use and attitudes towards IT use with these learners and found quite a different picture than was presented in these sector reports. And I won't go through it in detail here today because you can look it up. Oh, I keep going too. But um, these are just some of the, the, one of the ways that we presented the summary about what it was that learners were saying. So learners did not present themselves as digitally literate. In fact, they presented themselves as ne needing an awful lot of ongoing development and really saying that, yes, they would like to work as partners with lecturers, but um, only because that they felt their voices really weren't being heard very much at the moment and that their teachers were making assumptions about the extent of their digital literacy. Okay? So I think research is, learning experience research is really important because it helps us to understand what we might be making assumptions about, how we might be overgeneralizing from a few fantastic learners like Yuki to a whole population of learners who aren't actually as sophisticated in their use of technology. And in fact, there are other studies that show left to their own devices, learners' use of technology is rather passive, 
rather superficial, largely about accessing information and improving the presentation of their work. And that's putting aside plagiarism. But, you know, those are the, the uses of technology that, that we know about. So my third and final idea, then, is what we can do to make it easier to disrupt institutional practices. So we know that there are plenty of examples of technologies being used to emulate existing practices. The lecture, loads of technologies around the lecture. We keep the lecture. We just add a bit of technology to it. There are plenty of examples of technologies being adopted in order to support existing practices, whether that's to do with teaching or assessment or student support or anything like that. And we've had it a lot with student support, actually. You know, email your advisor and then come in and talk to them rather than the advisor actually leaving the office and going out and talking to the student, just as an example. Um, and I think there is lots that we can do to disrupt institutional practices. I suspect this is the one that at Oxford Brooks we've made the least progress on. It might be different for you. I'd be interested to hear if anyone's had better success. MOOCs, of course, is the classic example here. Um, but I'll talk about this quote from Molesworth and Nixon a little bit first before I, I talk about the MOOCs. So this is, this is an old quote. This is an, uh, an old study hidden away in a book chapter in a book you've probably never read about staff development and educational development. But it's a really beautifully written up story um, from two practitioners who, frustrated by their institution's use of the VLE back in 2009, 2008, set up online spaces with no hierarchy and invited everyone in. I think it was journalism, and they invited journalists from the region, they invited learners and potential learners and teachers, but they didn't la label them as teachers, and some kind of peer buddy, more experienced students. They just invited everyone in and anticipated that all the community members would use this space to initiate and join in free-ranging discussions about their degree subject, okay? Uh, in reality, as we, we know now, <laughs> with the benefit of hindsight, that there were very few discussions. Um, the students were passive, uh, and where they were asking questions, they were asking questions about... Anybody want to guess what they were asking? Que assessment, did you say? Yeah. <laughs> and they were asking questions about assessment, okay? And, they, and, and I've lifted this quote from them, that we persistently and even increasingly reinforce the very behaviours we find frustrating. We respond to our students, our consumers' desires for content, structure and assessment. That's what our students ask us for, content, structure and assessment. So we design things. And we find it really difficult to move out of our kind of performance roles. We're unable to break out of the fixed roles that we have to act in different ways, OK? And they conclude that although technology provides the scope to provide new educational spaces, actually what you need is more work with people to change the way they operate within their established roles. Not about the technology, it's about the people. Right? Uh, and we've had this with, with MOOCs at, at Oxford Brooks. So we um, don't call them MOOCs because aren't uh, someone said TOOCs earlier, so we just dropped the, the first initial completely and call them OOCs. So we have open online courses because ours aren't particularly massive. Um, we, we were one of the first UK universities to run MOOCs, but they came out of our staff development unit. So we ran the first steps in learning and teaching course. Uh, it's in the sixth iteration, sixth. Oh, some nodding. Some people have heard of it. Excellent. First steps in learning and teaching is in, in its sixth year now. Um, and we run teaching online, open course. Uh, so th those ones have been going. And so, of course, we went to senior management. So we've been running these brilliant MOOCs out of our staff development unit. Can we have some money? Is this being recorded? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so they gave us quite, quite a lot of money, some of which I had to give back after three years because I hadn't spent it, hadn't managed to actually do what I'd wanted to do in encouraging faculty staff to develop MOOCs in the same way that we had within the staff development unit. The one that did run, absolutely fantastic MOOC, is the biodiversity monitoring. There's a lovely little video, I won't play it for you now, which, which advertises this course. And um, it's the only one. It's the only one that we managed to get going. Now, when we did our final evaluation, of course, we're really evaluative uh, in our unit, we did a final evaluation, and we're trying to find out what stalled the progress of the development of these MOOCs. And it was things like, um, which budget should it come out of within the faculty? Um, how do I account for someone's involvement in a MOOC within our workload planning framework? 
Uh, where does the money from the students go because it doesn't fit with our resource allocation model? All right. These are the reasons that our pocket of innovative good practice was not spreading across the institution. And of course, this is where our third space comes in, that you need these kinds of things to be developed, probably to be run from the fluid third spaces which don't have the boundaries, the rules and the structures that exist within organisations in order to make them work. So we need to invent our own rules from the bottom up and then turn them into university structures and processes. And I was listening to Sarah Berry, is she still here? Yes, talking about collaborative framework agreements between different institutions. And this is just the same problem, isn't it? Yeah. So we know that one of the things that we could do to design new educational products which meet the needs of employers and our learners is saying, well, you take a bit from this institution, you take a bit from this institution, you put it all together, but trying to get that working is really, really tricky. So some of the things that we did manage to do and some of the kind of interesting ideas about how you break out of institutional structures, I guess, then. Um, so we've, there's things like uh, online tutors or online mentors employed by lots of different universities. So the nature of what it means to be a, an academic or a faculty member of staff, I think, is changing. You can be almost a self-employed faculty employed by lots of different institutions. And, in, you know, I teach for the Open University, but that's not quite it. But we certainly have people who work for us who are making a living by teaching MOOCs all around uh, different universities. Um, Marion Waite, one of our helper tutors, talks a lot about the notion of uh, skilled orienteers, guides, expert participants. So these were uh, learners who knew how to be learners within an open online course, who had done previous open online course and helped our learners to navigate their way through it. And they were really, really interesting. And they kind of emerged in the first couple of cohorts. And in the later cohorts, we tapped people on the shoulder and said, would you like to come back and be an expert participant and blog about it? Certificates and badges I've already heard a lot about today, so you're obviously all well up on those. We did manage to design a light touch quality assurance process to get our MOOCs validated a little bit more quickly. So that was, that was one success. Um, but really, it's have you got this ability to negotiate different staff roles, responsibilities and workloads and get people working on things which don't fit in to the normal structures? And Celia Whitchurch has, has written uh, quite a lot about this for the Leadership Foundation. Uh, about third space professionals, which is worth a read. Okay, so I think what I'll do is I'll try and draw it to a close and then we might have time for a few questions. So you can fill in your own um, uh, third bit of the questionnaire at your leisure. But I guess what it means for us is about who's sitting around this table. So yes, I would argue that all of these different people should be sitting around this table, that we all have a responsibility to be digital leaders. I think it's unlikely that we'll be able, I think as I said in my introduction, predict the future of technology. I think that's unlikely. History shows us we're not terribly good at predicting the future of technology or even what the next big disruptive influence is going to be. But I think we do need to understand the context that we're working in, whether it's the marketplace of the UK or the changing demographics and austerity in Ireland or whatever it is, understanding that national context is really important because we need to understand where our products and our services fit into that market, if you remember that grid. Are you trying to develop for a new market? Are you trying to develop an existing product for a new market? Are you trying to develop uh, new products for new markets? And I think also in terms of the, that's kind of market drivers, in terms of the society drivers, we really need to understand the needs and expectations of our learners about what they want from education and, uh, and the needs of our employers and be a bit more proactive about saying, this is the purpose of education, this is what it's for, this is what we are preparing our learners for. So I will leave you, I won't talk through these, but I'll leave them up on the slide if you want to... Um, to have a look, this is my pick and mix bag of things that you might like to take away, bearing in mind the proviso that these are really contextually dependent on what's going on within your own organisation. So these are some practical ideas which either have worked for us or that we're still working on at the moment, and, um, but I, I can't guarantee they'll work, but I'll be interested to hear what other kind of ideas people have. So I think I'll stop there and let a couple of questions.